Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock, so we should start. Um, and I think on behalf of myself, Eloise Murray and Paul Palmer, we'd like to welcome you to the first um, Europe-based, and we put that in inverted commas because actually we're not in Europe, and well, not all of us are in Europe, uh, just can use a meeting. And as we start the technology, there we go. So this is the first uh, GeoSCAM meeting of this kind, both because it's the first European meeting and it's the first meeting that we've conducted remotely um, over Zoom. So uh, a couple of words before we start. If you're not presenting, um, switch off your video and mute your sound. Um, if your sound of mic isn't working, then um, use the test features on the Zoom. And actually, we've been through with all of the panelists this morning, so all of that should be fine. If we do hit a problem with um, the internet and people's internet being unreliable, then we'll progress onto the next speaker and then hopefully come back to the, um, the, the problematic um, case at the end. And so be ready for sort of on the fly adjustments to the um, schedule. Um, if all of Zoom goes down and the internet collapses, um, we may need to use the break between the morning and the evening sessions to recover. Fingers crossed that's not going to happen. So we were overwhelmed when we sort of saw how many people um, had uh, signed up to be to come along to the meeting. We've got 145 attendees um, spanning 18 countries. Um, surprisingly, for a European meeting, the uh, largest group seemed to be in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area and in the Beijing, China, China area. Um, but we've got a good smattering of people from across Europe um, also attending. So we were very happy um, to be able to see that we were able to pull together a reasonable number of people from Europe um, to talk about geoscan related activities. Um, we think we've got an exciting set of talks this morning. Um, the first, um, the most important kind of most interesting talks will hopefully come from our keynote speakers. And we've got three fantastic keynote speakers. So this morning we've got Nadine Unger from uh, Exeter. Um, and then on Wednesday, we've got Volkert and Anya um, who are gonna talk to us um, and those should be fantastic. This afternoon, we've got a, a model overview talk and that's going to come from Daniel Jacob and Randall Martin, the model scientists. And over the next couple of days, we've got 25 science talks and 16 posters covering air quality, greenhouse gases, interface of satellites and models, and aerosol. So one of the things that's going to be different is that we're not going to be so easily able to ask questions as you would be if we were in person. But we have got some mechanisms for you to be able to do that. The first of which is the question and answer button, which is, should be at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question um, that you want to ask the uh, speakers, if you type that question in there, whoever is chairing the meeting um, will ask those questions on your behalf at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the talk. Um, if there isn't time to ask your questions or you want to follow up with a more in-depth question, then there's 20 minutes of networking at the end of each session. In the emails that you've been sent, you should have been sent the Zoom link for that networking. And so if you want to ask a more in detailed question, there's an opportunity for you to be put into a Zoom room with one of the speakers, which will allow you to uh, chat in a more informal way about that. Um, if you want to, the poster information um, should have been emailed to you or will be emailed to you very soon. Um, and this will tell you how to go and talk to people about their posters. Um, each poster has got an individual Zoom room, which has been set up by the poster presenter. And so if you go into that Zoom room, you should be able to go and talk to people about their posters. Uh, a reminder that the webinars are being recorded. And so we're going to make those available through the GeoSCAN YouTube channel. Um, try and enjoy the meeting as much as you can. It's not the same as having it in person and we're not going to be able to go to the pub afterwards, which is always a disappointment. Um, but if you uh, enjoy the meeting and try and interact as much as you can with the speakers and the presenters, 
Um, if you have any further questions about the meeting logistics, if you pop them into the questions and answer button at the bottom, then we'll try and answer them. So we'll give people a couple of minutes to try and see if there's any questions from them. And in the meantime, I think the first speaker is going to be Professor Nadine Unger from um, the University of Exeter. And so we can bring up her presentation. Also, please be gentle with us if we make mistakes with Zoom. This is the first time of us doing this. So um, uh, Eloise is running Zoom for this session. Um, okay, so there are no questions. So if we go to Nadine's first slide. Okay, Nadine. Oh, I'd like to start by saying an enormous uh, thank you to our hosts and organizers who've put together a, a really nice meeting under very unusual circumstances. So air quality and climate change issues are strongly interlinked through the short lived climate forces. Those are ozone, methane, and aerosol particulate matter. And the short-lived climate forces have complex impacts on local, regional, and global climate change, ranging up, um, involving both warming and cooling mechanisms. Now, the role of the short-lived climate forces in climate mitigation and in, um, for example, Paris Agreement targets has been a matter of quite fierce debate, ranging from claims of half a degree C of avoided warming by 2050 to dire serious warnings about distracting from what's really important the carbon dioxide uh, mitigation. And uh, one of the most compelling arguments in support of the short-lived climate force mitigation is around co-benefits to surface air quality and human health. And one of the key remaining uncertainties is how reductions in short-lived climate forces impact the terrestrial carbon cycle and the land carbon sink. And so I'd like to talk a bit more about these issues today. Some background, ozone enters leaves through stomata and damages photosynthesis. And this has consequences for plant productivity um, and the land carbon cycle, the land carbon sink, also uh, for transpiration for the water cycle and therefore surface climate and for food production. And in fact, most of the research to date has focused on ozone impacts on crop yields. Aerosols can affect plant productivity through changing light and also uh, meteorology, and sometimes with beneficial effects. Um, now, most of the research has focused on the aerosol diffuse radiation fertilization, but it's not actually possible to change the light without changing everything else in the physical meteorology. And in fact, at large scales from the global perspective, the dominant impact of aerosols on the carbon cycle is going to be, is the um, cooling of the climate. And let us consider that if we had not had this uh, rise in anthropogenic aerosol 
pollution that in fact we would be living now in the reality of the 1.5 degrees C warmer world. So Professor Xu Yue has examined the individual and combined impacts of ozone and aerosol pollution from fires on the uh, GPP, the um, uh, Global Terrestrial Productivity, in the 2002 and 2011 uh, decade and uh, using GeosChem. So on the left panel here, we are looking at the impacts of ozone and aerosol from all sources except fires on terrestrial productivity. And on the right, we are looking at the impacts of ozone and aerosols from the fire source alone on the terrestrial uh, productivity. And a number of um, interesting things came out of this uh, study. One of them is that the fire air pollution source contributes 20% to the ozone induced global GPP losses. So globally, um, the uh, loss of GPP due to ozone, it's about four to five petagrams of carbon per year. And 20% of that is from the fire air pollution uh, source. So when we published this uh, result, policymakers asked us, okay, well, where is the other 80% of the ozone vegetation damage coming from? Is that something that we can mitigate? So today, the question we will confront is uh, how does ambitious short-lived climate force mitigation impact planetary health? And what we want to get at here is what are the most effective strategies to uh, mitigate ozone vegetation uh, damage, PM 2.5 related human health effects, and the global temperature rise from the perspective of the short-lived climate forces. And we will apply a systematic assessment based on source emission sectors because it's a useful approach to identify priority mitigation measures and uh, to determine the efficacy of individually controlling sources. So to answer these questions, we absolutely have to use a global Earth system model. And global modeling of carbon climate and chemistry climate interactions have evolved as two entirely separate research communities who don't really talk to each other and who go to different meetings. So our strategy to deal with this situation um, about a decade ago now uh, was to implement a dynamic land carbon cycle module into the NASA GIS um, global chemistry climate model. And so uh, this framework simulates the exchange of carbon energy and water uh, between biosphere and atmosphere at the half hour integration time step of the GCM. And the framework includes a flux-based ozone damage scheme. So that scheme is seeing the online simulated uh, ozone concentrations. And also the framework now includes a dynamic methane simulation. So the model is actually simulating methane concentrations. We have assembled a database of all existing published laboratory and field measurements of GPP sensitivity to ozone, to elevated ozone. And we use this database to validate and evaluate the model performance. The model's doing a very reasonable job in um, reproducing the uh, observed GPP sensitivity to ozone, especially in the temperate deciduous uh, and C3 crop ecosystems, which happen to be the ecosystems where we have the most measurement data. And uh, this database is uh, fully freely available online to anyone who would like to use it. 
So we've performed a control simulation that is broadly representative of uh, the 2003 to 2007 climatological period, uh, which is when there was a hiatus in the methane growth rate, of course. And so we're using year 2005 emissions from the Yasa Eclipse database. Then we perform eight um, mitigation experiments where we uh, decrease by 50%. So we halve all of the emissions from the eight major sectors, agriculture, agricultural waste burning, domestic, energy industry, road transportation, waste and landfill and international shipping. So uh, to be clear, uh, when we halve these sectors, we're reducing all of the short-lived precursor emissions, so both the ozone and aerosol precursors. And then we use the model to calculate the impacts on the land carbon cycle, on PM 2.5 related human health risks, and the global mean surface air temperature. Um, and the results I'll show today are on the 20 year time scale. So they're 20 years after the mitigation took place. And uh, the results will generally be the decadal average of model output years 15 to 24. And I want to emphasize that the simulations are including changes to ozone, uh, to aerosols and to methane and also to physical climate change. So these, these experiments um, are, um, they're about attribution, they're not scenarios. If we want scenarios, we can use the SSP. So, so this, this approach is valuable because it tells us about attribution. So here are the impacts of ozone uh, from all uh, emission sources on GPP in the present day. So this is from the control simulation. So globally, the loss of GPP, it's about four petagrams of carbon per year due to ozone damage. And that is represents about 3% of the total GPP flux. So it seems small, but this is quite deceptive, uh, as I shall show later. And um, we also find that by far the largest losses of GPP due to ozone are in three key regions. So the Eastern United States, uh, Europe, and Eastern China, up to 13% losses of GPP annually in the present day uh, due to ozone damage in China. So it's worth mentioning that different Earth system model frameworks um, uh, have quite consistent uh, results, at least these broad results in terms of where are the most, where the most damage is occurring and the total global magnitude. So for example, um, the NCAR uh, CLM model and also the UK Joules model, um, and all of these models are actually using quite different ozone damage functions, um, but they're coming up with fairly consistent similar results. So the most damaged ecosystems globally are deciduous uh, broadleaf forests and C3 crops. And to first order, that is because of the mid-latitude co-location of these ecosystems with the highest elevated surface ozone pollution concentrations on the planet. So here's the response of surface ozone concentration to halving the emissions from the sectors. Uh, I think you can see by eyeballing this plot that the largest decreases are coming from halving transporta road transportation sector emissions. So to give you a sense of the magnitude globally, there can be uh, a 1.4 parts per billion decrease in uh, ozone on the annual global average due to halving emission sectors and in the key regions this can be um, as up to 4.6 parts per billion on the um, annual regional average. Uh, so here we have the response of the land carbon cycle of GPP to halving the 
emissions, the air pollutant emissions from the emissions sectors. And um, from the way that we set up the simulations, this allows us to ascertain that the dominant driver of these increases in GPP is in fact the decrease in surface ozone concentrations. So what we found for these experiments is that changes in aerosols and changes in physical climate um, are much smaller and generally not statistically robust. So what we can see is, for example, in eastern China, halving emissions from agriculture, energy, industry and road transportation has statistically robust impacts on, in, on GPP, increasing GPP in, uh, in that region. Whereas in uh, Eastern United States and Europe, in fact, only two sectors, uh, halving emissions from only two sectors, road transportation and energy leads to a statistically robust increases in GPP in those regions. So globally, 50% uh, reductions in the road transportation and energy sectors offer the largest benefits to land ecosystem health, so lead to the largest increases in GPP from the global perspective. And the increase in GPP uh, can be 750 teragrams of carbon per year from halving emissions from the road transportation sector globally. So this is mitigating the ozone-induced GPP losses by up to 20%. So it's quite interesting to consider that halving emissions from the road transportation sector globally increases GPP globally by approximately the same amount as fire emissions, all fire emissions decrease GPP globally every year. And we also find that um, there are differential GPP benefits across different ecosystem types. Um, so there are typically, this happens regionally and globally, larger benefits uh, for the um, C3 crop and grassland ecosystems as compared to the forest ecosystems, so deciduous and evergreen forests. So to first order, this is because different ecosystems have different sensitivities to ozone, so the, the slope of the dose-response relationship is different. So we get uh, differential benefits uh, to different ecosystems. Now, if we come back to the original plot here, so this is the impact of ozone from all um, emission sources on GPP in the present day in the control simulation. And in reverse, this plot uh, can actually be viewed as the maximum potential increase in the land carbon uptake that can be achieved if we were able to hypothetically remove all of uh, the ozone vegetation damage. So it's, it's a plot in reverse of the additional CO2 that can be sucked out of the atmosphere by photosynthesis um, in the absence of ozone vegetation damage. Natural climate solutions are very fashionable these days, and they are all about improving the functioning of existing ecosystems. And there have been some uh, quite bold estimates in the published literature for their possible contribution to climate change mitigation. Um, and these bold estimates are in fact sums of many individual measures. And the largest of those individual measures are, for example, natural forest management that can potentially increase 
the land carbon sink by 0.4 petagrams of carbon per year, um, our improved plantations that could increase the land carbon sink by 0.12 petagrams of carbon per year. So if we convert uh, our GPP results to uh, net ecosystem exchange, a land carbon sink, this implies that the maximum potential of ozone vegetation damage mitigation to increase the land carbon sink on, rel on short time scales is about half a petagram of carbon per year. So it's a lot of carbon. We're talking about a lot of carbon in, in this um, ozone vegetation uh, damage from the global perspective. So if we look at our um, uh, individual mitigation experiments, uh, halving emissions from road uh, transportation could increase the land carbon sink by about 0.09 petagrams of carbon per year. From the energy sector, the increase could be 0.06 petagrams of carbon per year. So we suggest that ozone vegetation uh, damage mitigation uh, provides a unique opportunity to contribute to negative carbon emissions. It offers a natural climate solution that links fossil fuel abatement, air quality, and climate. However, from these individual sector results here, we can see that achieving the benefits requires ambitious mitigation pathways that tackle multiple source sectors. So all of the um, research to date um, on the ozone vegetation damage in the um, global earth system modeling has been based on limited dose uh, response functions in tropical ecosystems. Um, and so we're very excited to be involved in um, a, a collaboration with James Cook University in Australia that is providing um, new, or in many cases for the first time, uh, dose response functions for uh, tropical plants, for ozone damage to tropical plants and also uh, tropical crops. So these um, open top chambers here, these are the real experiments at James Cook University where the tropical plants are being poisoned with elevated levels of ozone. Uh, so, um, the World Health Organization has declared an aspirational goal to reduce the number of deaths from outdoor air pollution two-thirds in 10 years in the next decade. And so we have calculated the PM 2.5 related human health effects um, for our control simulation and mitigation experiment simulations using the global burden of disease method from 2015, um, which is the integrated exposure response model that includes five health endpoints from Burnett. So this plot is showing the total mortalities due to PM 2.5 outdoor exposure in 2005. So our uh, total estimate is about 3 million premature mortalities globally um, due to PM 2.5 outdoor exposure. So of course, there have been many of these uh, studies um, using this method to uh, calculate the PM 2.5 related health effects of different sources and uh, sectors. However, most of these studies are only based on one single year of PM 2.5 concentration output. So they um, have only one meteorological year in their analyses. So here's the response, the avoided mortalities um, when we halve the emissions from the uh, major sectors globally. And the total 
global avoided mortalities are shown in this table on the right here. So the largest benefit comes from halving energy sector emissions that would lead to a 0.2 million per year uh, decrease in the number of uh, PM 2.5 related mortalities. What we find is that global cuts of 50% in emissions from shipping, agricultural waste burning, and waste and landfill do not have statistically robust impacts on avoided mortalities relative to natural climate variability based on 10 model output years. And so this has been, this issue has been pointed out previously by Rebecca Sari last year and co-authors. And I would like to suggest that global model assessments have been pursuing higher spatial resolution, which is perfectly understandable and valid, but it seems to have been somewhat at the expense um, of multi-year simulations. Um, and so this approach has been masking quite an important source of uncertainty. So halving emissions globally from the major sectors, energy, agriculture, domestic, um, 30 seconds, Nadine. Okay. Uh, this has only a few percent impacts on the PM 2.5 related mortality risk globally. And um, this shows up regionally too in China and India. And it's because of the shape of the dose response function. And this has been pointed out uh, by. Josh Apter and co-authors a few years ago. So um, the shape of this dose response function means that there are formidable challenges to achieving the World Health Organizational, Organization aspirational goal by 2030. So in the interest of time, I'm going to shoot ahead to the last slide here. Um, and um, make the overall point that there is a scientific uh, consensus um, that reductions of short-lived climate forces does play a pivotal role in simultaneous mitigation of climate change, air quality, and multiple sustainable development goals. There's actually much less agreement on the actual mitigation potential um, and impact. So there's lots of science uh, left for us to do, uh, waiting for us to do, and uh, doing this science requires advanced coupled uh, chemistry, aerosol climate, earth system models. These models are mandatory to capture the complexity and guide the policies to avoid the unintended consequences. A recent example being um, decreasing aerosol in one region actually leading to increases or driving in part increases in surface ozone, for example. So Geoschem is a critical tool in this endeavor. I'll finish there and be happy to answer any questions. That was great, Nadine, that was really interesting. Um, so I'm gonna ask the questions and the first question is it was really nice to see that the plant exposure studies of more tropical species are being conducted because you know most of these studies have been done in the mid latitudes for crops which are important to um, the, the sort of industrialized countries. Do you know whether those studies are studying other things like droughts and predatory pests on on those species? And so, how complete are those studies? Oh. Um... Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, I do think these experiments include changes in water and nitrogen, and um, also changes in BVOX are being monitored, but I'm not, I don't think this particular round of experiments include, there's any plan to include um, uh, insect activity or um, predator-prey type relationships. 
Cool. Uh, so the next question is, how large do you think the uncertainties are in some of the conclusions that you've come to? And which processes do you think are the ones which are contributing the most to that uncertainty? Uh, well, we have provided uncertainty estimates for all of the results that I have shown today based on um, natural climate variability and uncertainty in the dose response functions for different impacts. Um, I believe that there, um, there is still a source of uncertainty from intermodal differences. So not the broad results, um, but for example, when we come down to specific regions, I think there might be intermodal differences. So we need to have multi-model assessments to get at that source of uncertainty. And, and so one of the things that was sort of sprung to mind is the sort of organic aerosol production and then organic aerosol scattering lights and those kinds of relationships. Do you think they're ro your conclusions are robust to uncertainties like that? Or should we be spending more time looking at some of those relationships? Uh, we should be spending a lot more time and money looking at secondary organic aerosol production from anthropogenic and biogenic uh, sources. But uh, the impacts uh, on, of ozone damage on vegetation, I'm not sure would be affected uh, by that. The um, human health effects assessment, this is basically a risk assessment. The numbers are risks um, and should be seen as, as risks. So we're looking essentially at sensitivities and where we are in that dose response curve and how fast we can come down it um, essentially. So I think um, organic aerosol and the deficiencies in the global modeling will of course uh, play, play a role in that uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't put an exact number on it. We did actually um, do the best job we could by comparing uh, our PM 2.5 global simulation with the GASP uh, database that I, is from Leeds University. I think we had 200 sites where we had five or more years uh, of measurement data in the past decade, in the most relevant decade. And the model's doing a reasonable job. Um, there isn't a suggestion that there's something massively missing actually in the model, but um, that's, that's the situation we're in. That's cool. Um, normally at this point, we would give a big round of applause to Nadine for saying thank you for, for the talk but it would seem a bit lame if I just did it by myself. So we're not gonna do that. So thank you very much, Nadine, for that really interesting talk. We're now gonna move on to um, the, um, the individual speakers. Um, and so the first one of those is Xu Feng um, from Peking University. So if we can bring up her slides. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Xu Feng from Peking University. Today, I'm very glad to introduce the recent development of 4 version 2. At ITC9 meeting last year, we have released online one-way coupled of gc model, which were able to drive the JUSCAM modules using online meteorological fields simulated by WOLF. And in 4 version 2, we have incorporated the aerosol radiation and aerosol cloud feedbacks to meteorology which allows the JUSCAM users to investigate the interactions between meteorology and air quality. So what are the aerosol radiation cloud interactions included in WOF-GC? For aerosol radiation interactions, aerosols directly influence the radiative transfer by scattering and absorption, thus impact the vertical distribution of air temperature and the stability of boundary layer. For aerosol cloud interactions, uh, aerosols can also impact the cloud droplet number, cloud optical properties, and precipitation by serving as CCN. 
and, and then the altered meteorological conditions in turn influence the chemical processes such as the photolysis chemistry, PBL mixing, and wet scavenging. Here is the architecture of two-way coupled OFGC model. In one-way coupled OFGC, we have designed a coupling structure consisting of the state conversation module, state management module, and juice cam column interface, which were used for data translating and chemical calculations. Uh, this allows the two parent models to be updated independently and to run in MPI-based parallel architecture. Uh, the two-way coupling structure inherited and further extended the one-way of GC coupler. It has implemented three modules used to diagnose the measured number of aerosol size distribution, the aerosol optical properties, and the aerosol activation. The three modules are called after the chemical calculations performed by JuiceCam at each chemical time step. Uh, figure B shows the framework of aerosol effects on the radiation and the macrophysics in WolfGC. By default, aerosol species except dust are simulated as bulk masses in JuiceCam. There is no information on aerosol size distribution and particle number. So we need to assume the aerosol size distribution for calculations of aerosol optical properties and aerosol activation. We developed a module to diagnose the aerosol mass and number of each chemical composition in four specified size bins. And then three optical properties and cloud droplet number are calculated based on the diagnostic variables in OFGC coupler and transferred back to the radiation and the macrophysical modules in WOLF. When developing WOLF-CAM, the WOLF model has supplemented the interface to couple the aerosol effects in several radiation and macrophysical schemes. Here we show the schemes supported in WOLF-GC. If we turn off these indexes, WOLF-GC version two operates exactly like the one we coupled model. In order to evaluate the model performance of two-way coupled of GC, we first validated the simulated aerosol and cloud optical properties. Uh, the figures show the spatial distribution of seven-day mean AOD from SOMI MPP various observations and of GC simulation, including ACR interactions during a haze episode in January. And we compared the day-to-day -day variation of simulated wavelength-dependent AOD with the AeroNet observations at four sites over eastern China. Uh, UFGC will reproduce the high values of AOD over central China and captured the temporal variation with high correlation coefficients. Uh, next, we compared the July mean cloud optical depths and the effective radiance simulated by one way or two way of GC against the various observations. In one way coupled of GC, the initial cloud droplet number concentration is prescribed as a constant, and a constant effective radiance is also used to calculate COD in the radiation scheme. But in two way coupled of GC, the COD is calculated based on the spatial temporary varying effective radiance and cloud droplet number concentrations. The simulated domain average effective radiance and COD agreed well with various observations in July. Uh, the COD from the one-way simulation were overestimated, especially in eastern China. The aerosol cloud uh, radiation interactions highly impact the meteorology. Here we show the differences of July mean COD, uh, surface downward solar radiation, and air temperature between the case with or without ACR interactions. The surface downward solar radiation and air temperature were changed due to the aerosol direct and indirect effects. The pattern of summer ozone differences was consistent with that of radiation or surface air temperature. In comparison with the monthly mean surface measurements of ozone concentrations, we found that including the ACR interactions reduced the mean bias by 6% over China 
and slightly increased the correlations uh, uh, and slightly increased the correlations in North China Plain and the Pearl River Delta region. The monthly mean uh, basis even decreased by 19%. So the ACR injections were able to improve the regional summer ozone simulations. Uh, in, ad in addition to the two-way injections, here we also show some other updates to OGC. Uh, we have coupled and tested the current JUSCAM versions to OGC, which can reduce the overestimation of nitrate and improved the simulation of winter PM 2.5. And we have implemented the online calculations of lighting NOx emissions, as well as the nested domain capability. Uh, thanks to my colleague Haipeng Lin from Harvard University and uh, GCST. Uh, here we show the hourly ozone simulations at the resolution of 27 kilometers and nine kilometers over the multiple domain. Uh, this case shows the ozone, simul uh, the ozone pollution in PRD region was due to the impact of typhoon periphery. Uh, and OFGC is open source and freely available. And we welcome collaborations. If you are interested in using OFGC model, please send us your information and intended general application. We will add you to a mailing list and keep you updated on new version releases. That's all my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. That was great. This is a fantastic new addition to the GeosChem family. Um, and so this is, this is really exciting stuff. Um, so the first question um, is to ask you, how does the meteorology that you're calculating from WARF compare to the meteorology that we're getting from GMAO for the standard kind of GeosChem? So are there systematic differences in things like boundary layer heights and that kind of thing? Uh, yes, the meteorological from Wolf was online calculated. Uh, so it can do some, so it can both can do the forecast and the handcast. But if you use, um, uh, I think, uh, if you uh, see our GMD paper uh, about the Wolf GC, uh, you can see the online simulated Wolf, uh, the, online, uh, the online simulated meteorological conditions is more, um, is more consistent with observations, uh, especially uh, on the PBL head and some other conditions. So I think this is very helpful to help us, um, this is very helpful to uh, have a more, <laughs> to have, have a better, <laughs> have, have a better air quality on simulations. Cool. And the next question is, can you explain a little bit about where the aerosol uh, microphysics sits? So is there the Thomas microphysics from GeosChem implemented, or is it a separate microphysics for, for the model? Yes, uh, I know uh, there is APM microphysics and uh, Tom's uh, microphysics scheme used in JUSCAM, but uh, WolfGC is based on the GCHP, the JUSCAM high performance model. Uh, so the um, uh, TOMS microphysics uh, scheme is not supported in GCHP, so in WolfGC model, we can't support uh, this scheme. Uh, but if the TOMS microphysics uh, Add to the GCHP model. I think uh, it's uh, it's better. Uh, it's very better to have it uh, coupled to OFGC. That's great. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, and we'll move on to the next speaker, who is Lulu Chen again from Peking University. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks for the chair's introduction. Uh, my name is Lulu Chen. Today I'd like to share something I've done recently. That's about the historical assessment of anthropogenic PM25 health impacts. Uh, according to the global burden of disease, the ambient particulate matter is one of the top 10 risks to human health. And uh, the PM2, PM25 related premature mortality is increasing all the way over uh, the past several decades. 
And uh, however, different regions are experiencing different trends of PM2.5 pollution over some developed regions like North America, there are decreasing trends. And over some regions with like um, a relatively low economic development levels, there are increasing trends like uh, the Indian. We know that the uh, severe PM25 pollution is driven by the increase in anthropogenic emissions. And the changes in anthropogenic emissions is, is driven by uh, the regional energy consumption, energy structure, the technological level, the emission control level, and all these factors are closely tied with the regional affluence level. So in our study, uh, we aggregate all the countries in the world into four groups according to their affluence levels. From the richest to the poorest, there are high income group represented by USA, upper middle income group represented by China, lower middle income group represented by India, and the low income group. And we can see that the anthropogenic emissions of these four groups has very different temporal pattern. There is an increased decrease pattern in high income group. I'm sorry. And uh, there was an increase over here and a decrease, a little bit decrease over here in upper middle income group. And for low middle income group, there is increasing all the way here. So based on these four groups, we use use CAM model to conduct simulations. In this simulation years, it's about uh, every 10 years. So to better quantify the anthropogenic emissions impacts, we conduct all the simulations using fixed meteorological conditions. And if we use the anthropogenic emissions from SAS and MIG, and we use zero F simulations to calculate the contributions from these four groups to the uh, surface PM25 concentrations for uh, this simulation years. And further, we know that the SIOE, BC, and the POA actually contributes the majority part of the anthropogenic PM25 pollution. And in this CAM, the relationships between BC and the POA, between their emissions and their concentrations are basically linear. And um, although there is a kind of a thermodynamic equilibrium in SIOA, it is also approximately linear if we take the SIO as a whole. So here, we, based on that, we can calculate the chemical efficiency of these three species. Here, taking the SIO, for example, we can use this camp to get the SIO concentrations due to anthropogenic emissions in China in this year. Then, according to this equation, we can get the relationship between the SIO concentration and its precursor emissions in China. So this is called the chemical efficiency of SIOA of China in this year. And further, we can combine this chemical efficiency with a new SIOA precursor emission, maybe from another year or from another scenario, so we can get the new SIOA constitutions for that year or for this scenario. So similarly, we can calculate uh, the um, the chemical efficiencies of SIOA, BC, and POA for this simulation years. Here we take the 1951 and 1960, for example. So after we get the chemical efficiencies for SIOA, BC, and POA for these two years, we use the linear interpolation to get the chemical efficiencies in any middle year. So 1955 is an example here. And further, we combine with the global based anthropogenic emissions in this year so we can get the SLA, BC, and POA's concentrations in this year. And here, the residual part includes the SIOA, dust, and CSA. And in terms of this part, we directly use the linear interpolation to get the residual part concentrations in this year. And then, summing all this up together, we can get the total surface PM12 concentrations in 1951. So similarly, we can get the continuous PM12 concentrations from 1950 to 2014, year by year. And further, I use the satellite-derived surface PM12 data to do improvements on our results. And we use the global exposure mortality model to calculate the PM12 related health impacts. Okay, here uh, shows the uh, cumulative premature mortality 
uh, attributable to anthropogenic emissions in these four groups from 1950 to 2014, uh, which is calculated by adding uh, the uh, mortality of a specific year and all the years before this specific year up together. So we can say that by uh, the year of 2014, the high income group contributes dominantly. It's, there are about uh, over uh, 80 million perimeter deaths due to its anthropogenic emissions. And um, we also can see that although high income groups start to control anthropogenic emissions decades early, it's dominant until the year of 1990. And we also can see that the increase in perimeter deaths due to lower middle income group is rapid, driven by its very rapid industrialization and urbanization. And before the, if we take the population into consideration, here is the um, cumulative per capita contribution to perimeter mortality, which is calculated by adding up the uh, per capita mortality in each year up together. So we can see that the uh, high income group always dominant over the past several decades. And we also can see that by uh, the year of 2014, actually per hundred residents in high income group has contributed about six perimeter deaths globally. And as we mentioned before, actually the air pollutants are the byproducts of economic uh, development. So here we try to link the regional affluence level to its per capita contribution to perimeter mortality like this. So the X axis here represents the um, per capita GDP of these four groups. So we can see a very clear reverse u shaped pattern between the regional affluence level and its per capita contribution to perimeter mortality. It is means that when the, um, I'm sorry, the Perimeter mortality caused by one resident in our South region would increase with is the South region's per capita GDP until this turning point. And after this turning point, a further decrease in the regional affluence level would re induce a substantial reduction in its per capita contribution to perimeter mortality. However, in the past several years, China has taken a lot of efforts to control its plastic anthropogenic emissions. So we can see a very great work here is a very uh, significant decrease. So may, although its per capita GDP is much lower than this turning point here. So unfortunately, um, it's a, maybe this pattern is being broken. It's a good news actually for us. Okay. Um, here are some take home messages. It's on my slides here. Um, thanks for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, just to remind people that if they want to ask questions, they should use the um, question and answer facility on Zoom. Um, so the first question I've got is that you've been looking back to like the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, yeah. when we don't have very good observational data. So how good do you think your simulation is in those periods? Uh, yes, that's a good point. Um, I think uh, we can, uh, firstly, I, I have to admit that the, there is a limitation of my study, but we, we kind of have a confidence on the geoscan model. Um, we have a very, we have a solid uh, chemical processes in the geoscan model and we we think we uh, use a kind of uh, updated anthropogenic emission inventory from SADS and we also um, uh, compare the anthropogenic emissions from SADS and from other global anthropogenic em emission inventories like Alligator uh, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, all the uh, emission inventories I can get. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know how f like accurate my results are, but I think it's kind of meaningful to us to to have the contributions in the in those years. Yeah. Cool. And I think Paul Palmer has got a question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I wanted to ask you a question about your slide five, where you showed the cumulative per capita contribution to premature mortality. So the, 
the you say that the high income group always dominates. I know AM maybe um, it's not slide five. It's, it's maybe it's slide, slide six. seven. <laughs> yeah. Slide six. Slide Thank seven. You. Slide. Oh yes. Oh no, maybe it's slide six. There's a delay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the high income group always dominates, but you can see that it's tailing off a little bit, and and you can see that the upper middle income group is rising quite rapidly. I'm just wondering what the reasons are behind that. Um, actually, uh, you mean, uh, you mean the figure B, right? So I'm this talking figure... about figure B. The orange line is rising. Do you know why? It's yeah. rising quicker than. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's uh, uh, driven by the uh, rapid increase in anthropogenic emissions uh, because you, you also can see a rapid increase in the lower middle income group, right? So, yeah. uh, and uh, we, we know that uh, there is a decrease in Chinese anthropogenic emissions, but, but this figure shows a kind of a cumulative thing. So the decrease in China maybe did, did not be uh, represented by this this line, I think, so it's, it's still, you know, there is a still a rapid increase in uh, upper, middle increase, uh, upper middle income growth. So, so yeah, people, people right. are getting richer and producing more pollution. We need to move on. Sorry, if okay. we're going to keep to the timetable. Um, so Thank the next you. talk is coming from Alfred Bockery from the University of Birmingham. Are you there, Alfred? Good morning, everyone. My name is Alfred Bokhari. I'm here to present on air quality and climate forcing of the charcoal industry in Africa, a component of my PhD research under supervision of Eloise Marias at the University College London and Rob McKenzie at the University of Birmingham. Charcoal is a solid biomass energy source. Charcoal is a solid biomass energy source used by more than 80% of the urban population in Africa. Its use is increasing at 7% per annum, mainly due to urban population increase, coupled with unaffordable energy alternatives like liquefied petroleum gas and kerosene. Production takes place in almost every, every country on the continent, and by 2030, we predict that production will double on the continent. The charcoal supply chain, which comprises production, transport, and use, results in release of particles and gases that can potentially impact human health and climate. Production starts with felling of trees, covering, cutting them into wood pegs, covering under earth, and heat in a limited supply of air. The process is inefficient and only about 9 to 30% of the wood is converted to charcoal. Pollutant emitted include carbon monoxide, non-methane volatile organic compounds, organic carbon and methane. After production, the charcoal is transported to cities by old diesel trucks and this results in emission of sulfur dioxide and black carbon. In the cities, charcoal is consumed by stoves, inefficient stoves, and this results in emission of nitrogen oxides and black carbon. The slums, which constitute about 60% of the urban population, are poor and mostly results in burning of plastic to initiate combustion of the charcoal, and this results in emission of hydrogen chloride gas. For our work, we estimated emissions for 2014 as a product of activity data and emission factors. We get the activity data, which is the mass of fuel burn from United Nations Energy Statistics Database and the emission factor, which is the pollutant emitted per mass of fuel burn from published literature. We then graded the emissions to their respective activity locations, which we map. We map the production locations as distance five to 50 kilometers from main roads. We map the city centers using residential road network from open street map. And we map the charcoal, the truck zones as distance two to 50, 50 kilometers based on the urban population. 
the larger the population, the farther away is the charcoal production zones. We further map the cities into slums and urban centers and then graded the plastic emissions to slums. The figure on the left here shows the graded emissions. We see here that most of the emissions are in East and West Africa. In 2014, 208 teragrams of wood was used to produce charcoal. This is about 24% of biomass burned from intense open fires in Africa. The least contribution is from truck, that's less than 2%. The image here on the right shows the total and relative contributions from the supply chain emissions activities. We can see here that production mostly contributes to ozone precursors, that is carbon monoxide, methane, volatile organic carbons, and methane. The use mostly contributes to particles, particulate matter, that's like black carbon, as well as like nitrogen oxide. Um, which is our uh, ozone precursor and HCL from plastic burning. Transport mostly contributes to the sulfur dioxide. By trajectory, these emissions will double in 2030. We integrate our emissions for 2014 into GeoSchem, a 3D chemical transport model, and then we sample the we did one year concentration, uh, we, one year simulation and sampled the surface concentration of PM 2.5 and ozone and the short and long wave flux, fluxes associated with aerosol and ozone as a difference in simulation with and without our, the, our inventory to estimate the air quality and climate forcing of charcoal in Africa. The image of, at the top and bottom here are, are shows the, con the concentration of PM2.5 and, and ozone from all sources. The PM2.5 from natural sources are mostly from wind blown, blown dust and for anthropogenic sources of PM2.5 and ozone are mostly from biomass burning in East and West Africa and from coal in South Africa. The, the, on the right here shows the PM2.5 and ozone enhancement due to the charcoal supply chain emissions. We see here that the, the emissions are highly concentrated in the East and West Africa. And um, for PM2.5, it's mostly local um, and ozone, mostly due to um, the shorter life um, time of the pollutant. Um, one thing we can get from this image is that at lower concentration, um, the effect is more fatal because when you look at the dose response curve, the, the at short at lower concentration, the, the slope is steeper. Um, we also looked at the seasonality effect in, uh, due to the, the emissions. We, see, we can see here that the, um, the effect is more pronounced in West Africa, that is for PM2.5 and ozone. And for PM2.5, it's more due to monsoon and the Hamatan winds. And the, we see the, the ozone formation is more sensitive to NOx during the wet season when the, the NOx is limited. The image here on left and right shows the top of the atmosphere aerosol forcing, aerosol and ozone forcing. Um, we see here that the aerosol mostly contributes to cooling, mostly due to scattering by organic aerosols, and ozone, most, ozone mostly leads to warming of the atmosphere due to um, interaction of ozone with the short wave um, medium, mostly with the short wave medium, reflect, uh, sh short wave radiation reflected from the Earth's surface. And the effect is mostly um, at the upper tr uh, troposphere as we see in the image um, in the figure down here. 
uh, which shows the vertical, vertical distribution of ozone. And by 2100, we see that the environmental impact of charcoal will worsen. That is when you will have about 13 of the 20, 20 largest mega cities in Africa. That is when we will have about 70% of the population of Africa in urban um, in cities. Um, this is what I have to share. Um, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question is from uh, Nadine Unger. Does your model simulation include the deposition of charcoal? How does the deposition impact soils in the carbon cycle? Does it have a beneficial fertilization effect? So is there a link between your charcoal emissions and the biosphere? Well, I want to think so. Um, although we, did, we could not look into that specifically, but I think the um, emissions of PM 2.5 um, could have an effect. Um, because like in East Africa, where the concentrations were more intense, we, we, we see that that could kind of affect um, 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 the, the plant productivity uh, due to reduction in, um, in, 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 reflect in the sun's radiant energy and as well as um, um, ozone to be spaced, ozone which um, kind, kinds of re re reacts with the plants as well. As well as ozone which tends to um, affect the plant productivity as well due to interaction um, with, the, with the plant stomata. Okay, and then the next question is, how do your emissions differ from the current DICE inventory? How does the emissions differ from? The DICE inventory, so the previous efforts to include. Oh, yes. Um, the DICE inventory um, looks, well, mine, mine is, and updated from and the dice inventory they they graded their emissions based on um the graded population that is to 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 rural and urban areas i graded my emissions i actually mapped the emission locations and i also further looked um at the the, the climate impact um, um, due to the charcoal emissions. The DICE inventory um, looked, only looked at the air quality um, impact. It did not okay. uh, yeah, cool. look at the climate impact. So that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Zhongjing Zhang from Peking University. Are you there? Hello everyone, I'm Zhong Jingjiang from Peking University. And my topic is about variations of PM 2.5 and associated health risk in China between 2013 and 2019. Zhong Jing, you just have to uh, request control for the screen. For the screen. Um, right. Great, thank you. We first look at the spatial patterns and trends of PM 2.5. We can see from both annual and seasonal mean, PM 2.5 concentration is high throughout China, especially in Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region during winter time. And among the years, decreasing trends can be seen in all three megacity clusters, including uh, Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, Yangtze River Delta, and Peru River Delta. Then we check the day-to-day -day variation. This is done by first applying a wavelet to filter the high-frequency signals in PM 2.5 concentration, and then UF to decompose the mode. Sorry, this is a bit slow. 
There are two distinct spatial patterns in all seasons during the six years. Uh, each year has two columns. The first column is EOF1 and the second column is EOF2. EOF1 mostly show an in-phase spatial pattern, while EOF2 generally show a dipole pattern. From the perspective of meteorology, according to previous studies, uh, this pattern is likely reflected the regional ventilation. Leo 2018 attribute both spatial modes to wind-related dilution. However, we found that uh, chemical drivers may also contribute to the relative stress of the two spatial modes. Here we use those chem model to interpret the chemical drivers of the first of the observed PM 2.5 day to day variation, and we use uh, 2014 as an example. We can see that model can capture the observed seasonal mean distribution, although with a slightly underestimate. Then we compare the first two leading EOF modes and pieces in the observation and simulation. The left one is the comparison of the first and uh, second EOF modes. The first and third column is observed EOF1 and EOF2, and the second column is the simulated result. And the right figures is the comparison of pieces. This consistency proved that JUSCAM has the ability to reproduce spatial temporal variabilities as well as seasonal mean. This provides us with confidence that JUSCAM model can be used to examine the chemical drivers of the observed day-to-day -day variability. This figure shows the first EOF modes of PM2.5 and its chemical components, including primary and secondary components. A great many information can be dug out here, and I'll take uh, secondary components as example. The first EOF for ammonia and nitrate reflect general in-phase pattern in all seasons uh, in 2014. In contrast, EOF1 of sulfate and anthropogenic SOA shows uh, the dipole pattern in summer, and these patterns are more consistent with the uh, PM2.5 patterns in summer. This indicates that the major source of PM2.5 variability over eastern China uh, in summer was more likely due to secondary soviet formation, especially over the YRD. In the absence of widespread, widespread measurements of PM2.5 chemical components. We demonstrate here that a uh, juice chem model is a good tool to figure out the chemical drivers of total PM2.5 variability. Then about probability distribution, we show that gamma distribution is effective in representing PM2.5 variability. Uh, probability distribution, the beta parameter of the gamma distribution equals to the uh, ratio of variance to the mean. So it's a good proxy of extreme events. And this is a mean uh, beta plot. The mean PM2.5 concentration equals to the product of alpha and beta. The mean and beta value uh, were generally highest in BTH and Northern China for all seasons. This indicates more frequent occurrence of extremely high PM2.5 events in Northern China. And the seasonal mean PM2.5 uh, concentration in most regions is decreasing across years, particularly in winter and fall. These changes were mainly driven by the decrease of beta value. In other words, the changes in seasonal mean PM2.5 concentration were predominantly driven by less frequent occurrence of extremely high PM2.5 events. And finally, we examine the uh, health risks uh, associated with long-term and short-term exposure to PM2.5 in China during the recent years. For long-term exposure, AMR is the cost-specific mortality rate and AF is the attributable fraction. Um, the first row shows 
uh, the changes of AMR with PM 2.5 in six Chinese regions. Different color represent different years. And the following three rows are relative changes of PM 2.5, AMR, and AF. We can see that AMR and AF are both decreasing across the years with the decline of PM 2.5 concentrations for all regions. An interesting feature to notice that less polluted regions like Western China and Southern China saw larger relative benefits in AMR and AF per unit decrease in PM 2.5 concentration. This is due to the steepness of exposure response curve at the low end uh, PM 2.5 concentration end. And then about the short-term exposure we apply the exposure response curve in Chen uh, 2017. The first row is also the change of PM 2.5 and the second row shows the health risk decline. The solid line is to take uh, PM 2.5 probability distribution into uh, consideration and the dashed line is not. This obvious difference uh, enhance the importance of PM 2.5 probability distribution in counting short, the yearly average the, um, short term health risks. And the third rule is a sensitive test to prove that the actual decrease in uh, short term health risks were mainly driven by the decrease of the beta values, which represent less occurrence of. Uh, extreme events. And fun, this is a graphical uh, summary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was great. Um, one of the questions that I've got is the difference between the uncertainty in the model predictions and the uncertainty in the functions that define the health impacts. So we make a prediction for the, for the PM concentration, and then we translate that into a health impact. Which one of those do you think is the more uncertain? Do you think it's the model, or do you think it's the function that we use to make the health impact? Uh, as we compare the JUSCAM model result, we think that uh, JUSCAM is quite good to capture the uh, Physiognomy and spatial temporal variability. So we think um, in the model, the uh, concentration is quite, we think that is relative accurate and the uncertainty is more in the um, health function because uh, this is taken from the uh, health data and uh, I think the uncertainty is much larger in that that uh, IR model or long-term, short-term, that is. Cool, that's great. So I think the next person who's up is uh, Adedaido, Adedaiji. Um, so over to you. Yep. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, let me take this screen. All right, um, I'm Adidai Adedeji from the University of York, and my research is on the hair pollution over the East China Sea. Um, the objective of my research, it's mainly in two phases, which is measurement and modeling. We are taking measurements of um, the VOCs and oxygenated VOC at, at Terima Highland, which is an island towards the southmost part of Japan, off the coast of Taiwan. Uh, the site is already taking some measurements for species such as ozone, NOx, methane, ethane, and some CFCs. We would be analyzing the source and trends of the VOC and other species using the chemistry transport model in GeoSchem. Uh, unfortunately, our observations are running late due to the COVID lockdown. Um, using back trajectory model, to analyze the hair masses arriving at the Atarima Highland. The, during the winter season, most of the hair parcel received at the Highland are from the continental Asia, including China, South Korea, and Japan. While the direction of the hair masses changed 
during the summer, while the hair received them mostly from the clean Pacific region and the South China Sea. The implication of this is that during the summer season, the hair received is cleaner than the hair received during the winter. So and we can see this uh, with the elevated levels of carbon monoxide at the beginning and the, towards the end of the year. So we've used the standard 4x5 simulation, 4x5 modeling to simulate the CEO and compare with the observation. What we noticed was the underestimation in the 4x5 model. We also did the same modeling for ozone and the same trend is observed where there are underestimation during the beginning and the end of the year, while the summer season has cleaner hair and we could just get fairly better simulation during that period as well. This trend also was observed for ethane, where we can see that it's so obvious that during the pollution conditions, the model underestimates this. So we can also have seen that the precursors for ozone has been underestimated and it could actually lead to the, uh, the an estimate for ozone. So looking into this, it brings us to the question of why do we have underestimates such as in ethane? We could look, start to look into the inventory or we can start with the resolution. So since we've maintained Zumpa inventory in a standard four by five model, we try to use something different such as seeds at an emission. And using that, we realize it's even given worse representation of retain in this polluted conditions. So we have compared this seeds inventory with Zumpa inventory uh, using the flask measurement for ethane from NOAA across other sites around the globe. And we could conclude that Zumpa inventory has a better representation for ethane across the sites. And then we can look further to check the resolution of the model by using higher resolution nested grids. And then doing this, we did a short regional grid simulation at, this, at the region around Atarima Highland, and then we have this um, nested 0 0.5 compared with one degree, two degrees, and the nested four by five degrees. So comparing these, we could only see, only see that the, the, the model have more underestimation for the estimation of this uh, species. And looking into the two dimension comparison, we have actually, uh, I've reached the high resolution results to four by five here for better comparison. And we can see that the higher resolution actually gave a worse result. We were simulating less ethane in the East China region than the four by five, which is at the at this corner. The the at the site itself at the Terima, we have a difference of up to 20% between what the four degree is simulating compared to 0 0.5 degree. So we can start to think of why do we have such sensitivity in the, um, for, for the um, spatial um, resolution in the simulation. So this would require further analysis for us to understand such uh, sensitivity. So in conclusion, we We've been measuring high time resolution of VOC and oxygen VOC at the Atheromus uh, Island uh, to complement some measurement that have already been made. And we observed seasonality in the pollution level at Atheroma Island, which is driven by the direction of the air masses between different periods of the year. The model, the initial model simulation we had, which is COAS, actually estimates ethane concentrations. And um, at the sites, we were able to revalidate Zumpa inventory for ethane, that it's better than seeds, and across other sites around the world. So increasing resolution really did not help to get better results. It makes the result worse. And we would have to do further analysis on this to understand the sensitivity at the high end. Thank you very much.
Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. I think Eloise has got a question. I just had to relinquish control of my um, computer. Um, I was curious whether you had any plans to assess a regional inventory like MEIC. Yes, we can look into more um, to compare the different emission inventories. We started with ethane. We could use other regional inventories to compare and see maybe there is something better than what we are using at the moment, which could give us a better result. And then looking at ethane, we can also look at other species as well, not just ethane. Okay, that's great. So I think now we're going to go to the last talk of this session, and then that's going to come from Wynne, Triv, Tayan, Urak. Um, and so why don't we, there we go. I apologize for the pronunciation of my Asian names. <laughs> that's understandable. <laughs> Hi everyone, greeting from Thailand. Um, I, will be, I will be telling you about my project on mercury from coal combustion in Thailand. So uh, my name is Win Prai Vithyanurak from Chulalongkorn University. I'm the one working on the modeling and my colleague Kanapon from Nare Suwon University is the head of the field work team looking at the implications on the ecosystem. So, the argument for phasing out mercury is obvious. But for arguing about phasing out coal with regards to mercury, the question arises what are their contributions? In other words, if certain amount of coal fired power plants were to be closed down, what difference does that make to environmental mercury? So, GeoSchem is the tool to aid this investigation. I use nested grid Southeast Asia simulation to answer this question. I use version 12.6.1 and spin up from January of 2016 to run the year 2018 for the analysis. Um, I use the nested grid simulation for 0.25 by 0.3125 Southeast Asia as shown in this picture. The approach is to first improve the power plant emission data, then simulate in two scenarios. The first scenario has full emission and another simulation got high coal combustion turned off. The difference between the two scenarios is the mercury from coal combustion in Thailand, or I will refer to it as MCCT from now on. Then fish samples are collected at the position sites to elucidate on mercury in the environment. Mercury emission data from Thailand and um, coal power plants was updated using bottom-up plant-specific data, including operating capacity, fuel type, and air pollution control devices. The air pollution control devices are a crucial part as they determine the mercury removal efficiency and speciation. I use data from literatures as shown here. As much as possible, apply reference from Thai studies to have the most compatible data to the Thai context. The result is summarized here. So the original data was specially distributed from David Street's inventory using the Gaia emission as spatial distribution proxy. Special thanks to Yan Su Zhang for providing the raw data and extensive explanation to the original wet emission. So the new data is a bit smaller overall with higher elemental mercury ratio and specially very different. This reflects the more accurate point source locations. The figure for reactive gaseous mercury and particulate bound mercury looks similar to the elemental mercury or HC0, so I am not showing them here. With the approach to calculate MCCT or mercury from coal combustion in Thailand, as mentioned, I present the result in the form of a budget table. The chart shows the budget 
for MCCT on a global scale in blue color. It shows the source from coal combustion as well as natural source of the previously deposited mercury. Red deposition is the biggest source overall, bigger source overall. Total MCCT lifetime is 0.69 years. So this is similar to what was previously published in Noel Selin's um, 2007 paper of 0.7 year. I tried to calculate the budget for the nested grid region as well. So the, the story here is quite similar to the global budget, but some data gets rather tricky. For example, with um, divalent mercury, um, I got a negative. MCCT burden. So let's look at the plot. So in this plot, the example is shown here for divalent mercury or HG2. They are distributed throughout the atmosphere. But when looking at the divalent MCCT in the nested grid result, somehow um, there are some negative values, meaning that by turning off the coal plants, emission in Thailand. I get higher predictions over some place in China. This is still to be looked into, but overall I see MCCT concentration peak near its sources, like in this picture here. As for deposition, which is um, the linkage to ecosystem impact, I choose to present the results for August 2018 because it is the peak rainy month that we conduct fish sampling. The pattern is we see highest value of deposition near the sources and low value spread further afield. This global wet deposition plot ignores the very high values over the grid cells over Thailand for it to be able to show the color scales elsewhere. Uh, better position of MCCT occurs about 91% outside of Thailand, away from the source. As for dry deposition, about 45% of deposition occurs outside of Thailand. To look at the distribution more closely, let's look at the nested grid result. We can see hotspots of deposition domestically, both for wet and dry depositions. What occurs outside of Thailand differs between dry deposition and wet deposition. On the right figure, these are the deposition that I mark out the grid cells over Thailand. So for dry deposition outside of Thailand, um, we see that the downwind or the spreaded values covers the entire of China and eastern Russia. As for wet deposition, what occurs outside of Thailand uh, covers India, China, and throughout Southeast Asia. So um, since deposition is the linkage to the ecosystem impact, we take this information to uh, fish sampling activities. So fish sampling locations were designated to cover both locations of high and low deposition. For overall mercury, deposition of all sources and for mercury from Thai coal combustion. The plot on the left is for mercury wet deposition for all sources and on the right is for MCCT. So we collected the samples in August and now the laboratory analysis for mercury is ongoing. So we hope to see some trend in the mercury magnitudes from the results. Even though we realize the fact that um, the analysis from the lab would not be able to um, separate what is deposited from the coal combustion or from other sources, but at least we want to have some sense of what is found in the environment to begin with, because the lack of observations of mercury in the environment in Thailand. So in conclusion, 
the findings we see localized hotspots of hmm, my slides somehow went all the way back. My apology. Okay, findings. So in conclusion, we see localized hotspots of predicted deposition near the sources and over 90% of MGTT mass is distributed around the world and wet deposit outside of Thailand. As for dry deposition, what occurs domestically and beyond Thailand are of similar scale. There are a couple of noted issues. My calculated budget shows a bigger portion of particulate bound mercury than those previously published by Noel Selin and Sarah Strode. The difference between scenario approach gets tricky with the nested grid result. Um, for natural emission sources in the nested grid simulation, it is an issue to be careful with. I found snowpack emission to be artificially high with insufficient spin up time, and I found weird negative ocean emissions of MCCT. And the chemistry diagnostics for mercury in geoschem uh, right now lacks reduction rate. Um, and last is rather a, man, a minor point. My Excel calculation of emission screws up the tiny decimals. And so Excel should be used very carefully. This is just a lesson learned to be shared. Okay, so that's all from my talk. That's great. Thank you very much. I think there's a lesson for all of us about using Excel very carefully in there. Um, I think Eloise has got a question. Yeah, I was just curious in projecting forward um, in terms of Thailand's coal usage in the future, how much is it projected to change? There are some plans that there are some, some plans of um, new capacity going to be built in the south of Thailand. It's still an ongoing issue because um, there were some like, public oppositions and stuff. Okay, that's great. So we've come to the end of the first session. And so now what's going to happen is everybody can leave this current Zoom room and then you should have been emailed with the rooms to go to either to go and talk to people about their posters or the rooms to go to to be able to um, meet the, the speakers at the networking rooms. So at this point, if everybody leaves this room and then um, goes into the rooms that they're interested in, that's gonna carry on until around 12 o'clock British summer time. And then we're all gonna come back again um, at around two o'clock British summer time for the next session. So thank you very much again to our speakers for some really interesting talks. And we'll see people now in a range of different Zoom rooms to chat about different things. So thank you very much, everybody.